fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Third on KCW 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And, of course, I'm Al Warren. Sitting side saddle today is <laughs> Mr. David North Martino. Hey, Al. How you hey. doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I just got back from the uh, from the rally. I was the at, rally? Yeah. You know, the. I sent you a picture of it. I think, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I want my foreskin back. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that was quite the rally. You know, everyone's like, uh, you know, I, I was really surprised. Everyone's dressed up and they all wear white pants and they put blood on their, their crotch. It's kind of no. weird. <laughs> I, yes. I, I can't figure out, you know, people have too much time in their hands. Yeah, as far mm. as I'm concerned, that's just a little bit much for me. Yeah, but absolutely. <laughs> I was hoping I would catch, you know, a couple of glimpses of pictures or something, but no, it was boring. <laughs> no, it was boring. It wasn't no it such was, luck. No such luck. It was kind of it was wasn't that fun. So, you know, I guess that's what the truckers did. They ran out of things to do, so they decided to, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, today let's let's move right into it. We've got a guest waiting, so and we we don't like to keep them waiting. And this guy's. Uh, uh, got a great book. The book is called Upon This Rock. Amazing. And the author, of course, is our guest, David Perry. Thank you for being here, David. Well, ahoy. Thank you. I'm delighted to be on the show. It sounds like your protest was more interesting than the usual ones that I go to. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I always like to try to get in the middle of this and find out what's going on so I can let people know. But that, I didn't figure out anything. I really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, you know. I got to get involved. Um, yeah, the, uh, the the search for knowledge is never ending. I'm glad I'm glad to see you haven't you haven't given up. There you go. I'm not given up until I can no longer think, and then it won't <laughs> matter, right? So yeah. Well, that's and that brings in you know I I, I love history. I love old stories. I love. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we keep talking about things that have happened in in the past. I think it's important. Um, I also feel that a lot of young people are not doing this enough. And, and I'm not sure if that's just me getting old or them not doing it, because I'm surprised at how much um, information they really don't have or what they really don't know. You know, we were watching, uh, there's another reporter back in Minnesota going around asking people what the Holocaust was. And a lot of people were saying, isn't that that, what they named the um, ship up in space. Um, yeah. Another girl said, well, wasn't that um, those little red mint mints you get after dinner? Um, all sorts of weird answers. And I was thinking, wow, you know, it's funny, but it's not. It's kind of sad. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the Internet is a great thing. I remember, of course, I don't remember. I'm not even, even I'm not quite that old. But what Edward R. Murrow once said about TV, this thing can teach and for a few decades, that did seem to be the case. We learned from it. And then it became something that distracted us. I, I remember when ABC took over the management of the news and turned it into, quote, unquote, something under the entertainment division. I said, this is bad. News isn't supposed to be entertaining. It's supposed to be informative. And now the Internet at our fingertips, we have access to all this, quote, unquote, information. But we have to ask ourselves every day, you know, click or beware, what is true and what is not. So we have access to more information than ever in the history of planet Earth. But I don't know if we're any the wiser for it. Yeah, a lot of people I don't think really know how to research, so to speak. Like That's a big term. Do your research, you know, and they always throw that at you for some reason, you know. Uh, COVID's fake. It is. Yeah, do your research, you know, or something like that. And they <laughs> well, you know, I, I when I, I do a lot, you know, when I'm when I'm not writing books, I teach media and I always tell people if you read something online and it says click here or it looks too good to be true, it probably is. 
So unless I see it in a verifiable news source, uh, I don't share it. And I, I can't tell you how many people I have corrected politely, saying, well, no, uh, the, the daughter of Will Smith uh, it did not die. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know th things like that. And uh, no, the Titanic really did sink. It wasn't a conspiracy. So yeah, it's, uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there. You spend a lot of time batting down false information and of course, as a fiction writer, what I try to do is present fiction, but also when I write about history, and in my novel has, a, as you know, a deep historical context, I want to make sure the history is correct. Nothing irritates me more than when I read a work of historic fiction or see something on TV and they get the history wrong. And then I think, oh my God, now another five million people think that this happened on this date. So yeah, it, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic that we in 2022 have to uh, remember and explain uh, the Holocaust. Yeah, I just, I just wonder where, where it's going to because people don't seem to take it very serious. And you're right about history. So when you're writing something like this um, and you're going back in time or to a time, I guess you have to be very um, precise to the wording and how people acted, how they dressed, how they talked to each other. Like that's very important. It is to me. I mean, I certainly did my best. I mean, my novel, Upon This Rock, is a work of fiction. It was inspired by a real tragic event that my husband and I came across in 2014 when we went to this beautiful little Italian town uh, halfway between Rome and Florence called Orvieto. And it was a real-life tragedy. A young man, Luca Sedata, was a week away from being ordained into the priesthood, and he was denied the priesthood on the rumor that he was gay. And he was so distraught, he threw himself from the cliffs and killed himself. And we arrived in Orvieto on the fourth anniversary of that event. And what I found amazing was the serendipity of our arrival, but also the fact that this little town was still talking about it. They had really been moved by this, this horrible occurrence. And as I delved into the history of Orvieto, which is rich in history from the, the Etruscans, prehistory, the Romans, World War II, the Medici popes during the Renaissance, I just realized that this place, upon this rock, had a real historic underpinning that would be good for a fiction uh, mystery thriller. So Upon This Rock is a mystery thriller, but when you read in the book historic occurrences, something that the Medici Pope Clement VII did, or a story about the Italian uh, partisans fighting the Italian fascists in World War II, or a story from the Roman era, I promise you those dates and descriptions are accurate. I did a lot of research to make sure that if someone read my book and was walking around Orvieto saying, well, these characters are, are fictional, but if David Eugene Perry says that this battle took place on this date and this time, you can take it to the bank. It's true. So how do you decide what area you're going to write about? Like you, you, you fell onto this story and you know what, um, what you're centering it on. Um, but where do you draw the line and what's fiction and what's not? Is it like, like when you're adding characters, like what's, I guess your characters actually have a point to them. Well, well, yes, thank you. And several people who we know in Orvieto, dear friends, have said, well, is this character so-and-so and is this you? Is this Alfredo? I'm like, they're fictional characters <laughs> in a sense. I always remember what the, the author, Armistead Maupin, famed for Tales of the City, said when someone asked him once, well, who are you in your books? And he said, well, I'm all of them. So in, in a sense, there's a part of me in all of the characters as they develop. But as you walk around a place, at least what I see is inspiration for different characters. And there's certainly a lot of colorful characters in Orvieto, Italy, who found their way in one way or another into the book. But they're, they're all fictional. And for me to answer your question directly, it's all about place. Uh, my husband Alfredo said when the book was finished, Orvieto is not a place in your novel. It's a character. And that pleased me because... It has such a richness to it that I think it really is a character. And, and my next novel will be set in a small town in Spain with several of these characters going forward from Upon This Rock and also inspired by another small town with a true life tragedy, this time from the Spanish Civil War. So when you, when you I was going to ask that. So when you're, you're setting your place where you're writing about is actually a character, do you develop and treat that character the same as your human characters absolutely uh, to me the the importance of place is absolutely vital 
I could not have written this book and would not have found the story had I not been in, in Orvieto. So Upon This Rock is very much a story of Orvieto, and since we're all coming out of this horrible COVID era when people couldn't travel, nothing would make me happier than to see the film version of this made at Orvieto and bring tourism back. To me, the place is ultimately important. I remember one day when I was doing some edits on the book, I realized that a spot that I had mentioned in the book as being having one of the characters watch the sunrise, I suddenly realized, oh no, it's on the other part of town, it has to be sunset. So that sounds like a silly detail, and maybe no one would know that, but I knew that as the author, and I thought if someone's reading this book, and they go to this spot in Orvieto, and they look and they say, well, no, the sun wouldn't have risen here, it's the west part of town. That sort of telling detail is to me very important to me personally, and I know a lot of authors who say the same thing, that getting the spot right, having the inspiration of a place is is so important to telling a story. Yeah, I, I think it is too, because nothing drives me uh, more, I don't know, it just drives me nuts when I see or hear or read uh, something that's supposed to be taking place in a certain time, and they use modern 2020 phrases. Absolutely. I, you know, in my non-work life, I'm also a ship nut. I'm a maritime historian. And uh, I've seen every movie made about the Titanic, including one that the Nazis made that was buried in uh, World War II. Uh, there have been a lot of them. And I went to see the movie Titanic by James Cameron. And I kept thinking, I wish they would do an edit and just take out the love story. I mean, isn't yeah. <laughs> there's not very many events more dramatic than the sinking of the Titanic. I don't need the love story. And a couple of times I thought they spoke not like they were in 1912, but, but they were like in 1998. So uh, all, all deference to James Cameron for his wonderful film, but I feel the same way. Yeah, well, it, it ends up holding my attention, and I miss part of the movie or the story or the, or the, you know, the Netflix show. I end up looking for that then. It becomes kind of something I end up doing just without trying. And, yeah, like 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 the like the star like the Starbucks takeaway cup in that famous yeah. episode of Game of Thrones, <laughs> right? I mean, it couldn't get worse because then you it just it it takes the whole it takes everything it takes all of your attention. So then I lose yeah. I lose out on some of the story. So I think it's I think it's really important in that. Um, so when you when you're when you're putting this together, um, did you have kind of the story that you were going to follow and that brought in the character so did you have characters that you wanted in this story well that's a great question a little bit of both i mean the inspiration for the book came to me pretty much within the first week of being there i heard this two true story of this young man's suicide which i felt very compelling for a number of reasons one at one point in my life i very seriously considered the priesthood and then coming out as a gay man um, dealing with that dichotomy made me feel a lot of sympathy for this young man who took his own life because the priesthood was denied him and by all accounts he was much beloved in this town of Orvieto and then when I found out that it was in Orvieto 500 years ago in 1527 that Pope Clement VII had escaped and was living in Orvieto in much reduced circumstances having fled Rome after the sack of Rome when the ambassadors from London came to him requesting a divorce between King Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. And this real event led, of course, to the breakup of the Catholic Church and then, you know, of course, the Protestant Reformation. And all of that religious history taking place in one spot upon this rock fascinated me. And so the idea for a, a mystery, a murder mystery, came to me pretty much in an instant, and I knew how I wanted the mystery to unroll, unroll uh, and some of the characters didn't introduce themselves into my brain until I was about a quarter of the way through the book. And I was about halfway through the book when the ending changed, and of course I'm not going to tell your listeners because I want them to read it. <laughs> but. Uh, it, uh, I had heard over the years authors say, oh, well, the characters spoke to me. And I, I always heard that and thought it sounded like the most pretentious piece of stuff <laughs> until it happened to me. And when, you know, writing a book, I realized, oh, fictional characters, they do speak to you or your brain or whatever that mechanism is. 
they 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 changed how i was trying to make them go forward in the book so the writing of the book actually changed several of the characters and certainly changed the ending well i'm wondering too you you can hear your characters um and they've surprised you have they ever um like totally rebelled against the plot or um were you more in control of of what they were doing well, with, uh, I had one character in my my book certainly who rebelled uh, <laughs> there uh, and uh, did something that I totally did not did not expect. So yes, and I think in the next book uh, that will that will happen as well. And you know, I, I remember thinking and reading many times about the the great storyteller George Lucas, who I had the privilege of working with over the years. Talk about how many years it took him to get Star Wars down. And when you look at the Star Wars, the original Star Wars uh, movie, in a sense, it seems like a very simple plot. But over the years, how he developed to get to those characters that became iconic, it, it wasn't easy. Hmm. And uh, I've heard him talk about how the characters rebelled. So, yeah, the answer to your question is absolutely. Now, now these, these voices aren't telling you to do unusual things, are they? <laughs> No, I mean, yeah. well, you know, except for crime and murder, you know, nothing, all, all nothing the good things. Story. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but when you when you put this together, there's 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 so much history. There's so many details, and then there's the character and the mystery and and all of that on top of it. Um, so, so when someone takes this book home and finishes it, what is it particularly that you want them to take away from the book, or or is there several things? Well, there's several things. First of all, I, I want to thank you again for doing this this interview. I, you know, having a novel come out during COVID has got to be one of the more challenging experiences of my life, uh, and I've been very gratified. Uh, it's gotten incredible reviews. Armistead Maupin, of course, internationally known author, tales of the city called it an elegant, twisty thriller. It will do for Orvieto at Midnight in the Garden of Good and Eden, Evil did for Savannah, and Fenton Johnson gave it one of my favorite reviews. He called it the Gay Da Vinci Code, but a lot better. So I'm, I'm hoping that people, when they finish the book, will be a little bit surprised. Um, I'm hoping they will laugh a little bit, because even though it has been compared to uh, Dan Brown, who's of course an incredible author, I wish I had his readership and his agent, um, I sometimes miss humor in his writing. I find sometimes it's a bit just all uh, death and assassins and plots that might end the world. So my, my book has a good deal of humor in it as well. It is a mystery, it is a thriller. Uh, there's assassins, there's murder, there's intrigue, there's terrorism, there's human trafficking, but there's also a lot of history. The solution to the mystery, which takes place in the present day, actually is found 500 years later during the time of Clement VII. So the book goes back and forth between the present day back to 1527 and that to me was really fun to write the, the the history part about what what it was like to be in Orvieto in 1527 and like I say Knockwood so far it's doing really well it's won two awards silver, silver medal from the Independent Book Publishers Association kind of the Oscars of independent, uh, independent publishing and a gold medal winner from the San Francisco Book Festival so my, my publisher Pace Press has been very very happy and Knockwood the screenplay version of it is being written now, and hopefully sometime in the next year, I can get an option for a film, or frankly, I think it would be better as a Netflix series. Yeah, yeah, you can get better detail, I think, in a series, right? You have more time to explore some of the characters. Yeah, and I, t I don't know about you, but boy, COVID turned me into a Netflix subscriber. Yeah, <laughs> I think it did a lot of people, you know. Yeah, I spend a lot of time watching, thank God for BritBox. I have... I have watched so many people get murdered in quaint little British towns or in East Anglia. I can't tell you. I mean, between Vera, Midsum Midsummer Murders, uh, you name it, Rosemary and Time, Father Brown. I, I I love murder mysteries, and I don't think anyone murders people better than the Brits. I really don't. Well, I think I think you know, and I ask this of a lot of people that write in 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 mystery and murder and things like this, and you you might have an opinion on this too. I think the British. Uh, in general, write a different type of murder mystery. I think they they s tend to focus more on oh, what is it? It's it's like human behavior, human nature, mm -hmm. than than typical American writers. I, I, do you find there's a difference too? I do. My my favorite writer, and I cite two of them in the introduction to my book, 
is P.D. James, or you know, her official title, the Dame, Dame P.D. James of Holland Park. She died, actually, right around the time I was starting this book. And I don't know if you've ever seen a TV interview or heard a radio interview with P.D. James, but I remember someone asked her once, uh, you know, where do you get your ideas? You seem so mild-mannered, and my God, you've killed hundreds of people. And she laughed in that wonderful British accent, and she said, oh, well, you know, lots of research, lots of research. But to your point, writers like P.D. James and the British mystery uh, writers, I think they do focus more on character and psychological development. And one of the reasons I really liked P.D. James was because she had a full career as a British civil servant. She didn't start writing until she was in her 40s or 50s as well, like, like me. And by that time, she had a rich inner life. So when she would write about some of these characters, it was based on 40 years of professional life. And I, I think that that is the sort of writing that really interests me. Oh, totally. I think that's kind of the biggest difference. You know, some people will find it slow if they're looking for just solid action and not looking for character development. So it depends on how you look at it. But I, I love that type of writing myself. So um, when, when you get into your all the action part, the terrorism and the assassins and all this stuff going on, how do you gain knowledge from that? Are you, are you going out and terrorizing people, or like what? Where do you gain the? Uh... <laughs> well, my, my, my husband's not listening, so I'm so I'm, I guess I won't get in trouble by saying no. I haven't done that sort of research. Um, for me, I know I, that was kind of a silly way to answer. There there are a couple of characters in my book that would be described as just truly evil, uh, or I would describe them as amoral, and I found writing about them very interesting because I had to ask myself, what would it take me to do something like this? And that led to, uh, you know, I, I, I had, putting myself in the shoes of someone who is a brutal murderer or a terrorist, I found very interesting. One has to think about, well, we're all human. Uh, you know, as my grandmother used to say, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. I could kill someone physically. The question is, what would it take for me to kill someone? What would it take for me to traffic another person or be involved in, in terrorism? What would it take for me to actually pull the trigger or put a knife into someone? And I tried to answer that as honestly as I could, uh, what it would take. And then, of course, the second question is, what is it that keeps one from doing that? So I think a good writer has to fully explore all the dark sides of their personality as well to be able to write about that. And, you know, life is not sweetness and light. There are murderers and thugs and dictators out there, as we've, you know, sadly come to see in, in the last week. So um, I think we have to understand that as humans, we are all capable of the darkest impulses that have shown up during human history. And that leads to me to ask, you know, when you talk about that and, and how you said earlier, you're, you're really all of the characters. There's some of you in each character it, and, and you've written a story and you, and you have to share kind of your thoughts on, let's say, what it would be to be a killer or to be a terrorist or to be a assassin. Like you have to put yourself in that shoe, but you're still kind of putting yourself in the book through these characters and you're sharing a lot of who you are in the story. I just wonder, um, do you ever feel a little bit vulnerable when you're writing these, your feelings like this and letting anybody in the world read them? Absolutely. And I think that's the challenge. You know, I, I was once told by one of my favorite college professors, the definition of theater is the revelation of private truth in a public place. And I took that to be the definition of all art. Art is the revelation of private truth in a public place. And there really is no more public place than a page. So, yeah, there, are, there have been times when I was writing about certain characters that I felt that I was leaving myself vulnerable. Whether or not the public knows that's something that David Eugene Perry has thought or considered, I don't know. But I, I think to be a truly good writer, and by good I mean someone who writes something that hopefully people will get a feeling or an emotion from, one has to be revelatory about one own, one's own uh, human condition. So yes, I have uh, felt that. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I've written a lot of nonfiction, true crime and cult books and weird, weird sort of things, kind of um, following human uh, behavior and and what they what they've done with their lives and how it's affected others but um after each book th- there's sort of an effect that that comes from it and i wonder when you went through this book and you wrote the story and you completed it after all the research it's all said and done and it's sent to the publisher how do you think it changed you uh, well it uh I think it, it, it confirmed in me my my great respect for other writers, uh, and it confirmed in me my lifelong fascination with with history. You know, as I said, besides the, this is a work of fiction, but there's several incidents in the book that are referenced: a horrible World War II massacre in Italy, um, a horrible battle that took place during World War II, uh, events during the Renaissance. Those are all true. And my next novel is also based on a, a tragedy that took place, a horrible massacre during the Spanish Civil War. And for me, what I discovered about myself is I have a fascination with real historic events that took place and going back and asking myself, how could someone or a group of people do something that brutal to another human being? To me, it's not the crime that is interesting. It is the motivation of the people to do that crime and to remind readers that, you know, we could all do this. So, you know, hopefully what, what one gets out of reading true crime or, or crime fiction or mysteries is a better understanding of the human condition. So um, I think for the writing for the book for me made me realize um, just how important it is to to, to stay balanced and to to always keep exploring the uh, the deepest parts of the human condition. Now it looks like you also did some uh, freelance nonfiction writing. Um, was that um, a natural transition into fiction, or did you find it a challenge? Well, actually, it's the transition is kind of the other way. I mean, for the last thirty five years, I've you know kept the lights on and kept food in our bellies by running a public relations business. So I've ri- written literally hundreds, probably thousands of news releases <laughs> over the years uh, and have contributed to a couple of business books and uh, did have another novel that's sitting in a desk drawer that I wrote during the beginning of the AIDS era that I think now I might pull out because that character was writing about one pandemic and I thought about bringing that character back now 40 years later. Uh, writing about the end of another pandemic. But they're two very different talents, I think. Uh, to me, nonfiction writing, whether it's a news release or uh, writing a review, I had my own TV show for 10 years, uh, sitting in your chairs interviewing people. To me, that's all about, it, it's like a sculpture. It's like, okay, this paragraph has to do the who, what, where, and when and this paragraph has to give the emotion, and this paragraph has to give the details. So I think that training and structure of writing nonfiction, I hope, knock wood, helped me in my fiction writing because I have read fiction books that had lots of action and were jam-packed with uh, exciting events, but I didn't find that the characters were well explained as to why they found themselves in those incredible situations. So I think my nonfiction writing structurally helped me become a fiction writer. And now, knock wood, if I can live another 25, 30 years, there'll be a few more books in my, <laughs> my brain. <laughs> yeah, that, that, re- that kind of brings up, when you're writing a book like this, and especially when you're writing uh, it going back to, you know, say, 1527 and to the present time, back and forth and stuff, how, how do you structure this? Are you, when you're sitting down to write this, do you actually outline the whole the whole book and then put it together in places or was it two books put into one like how how did that work for you well thank you you know i a lot of post-its um <laughs> i i wrote the book chronologically um so i did not have a an outline and i've had certain people tell me oh it's so complex you must have had an outline i i didn't i i was writing chronologically and the characters were pushing me and I would say I was about a third into it when I really started writing fast. 
and realizing the, the goal I wanted to, to get to. Uh, but I still wrote chronologically. I didn't uh, have an outline. What I would do for the research, if I was writing a section that took place in 1527 or the years that followed that, I would have a whole separate page where I would keep important dates and whatnot. And as I would be writing, just the kind of flow of conversation and whatnot, if I had to mention a date or something, I would go back and check. And then I had other people uh, fact check the dates. So um, this one I wrote without an outline. The next one, I'm beginning to, to do an outline of it, but the outline's kind of in my brain. I tend to do my best writing as I fall asleep at night. I get ideas and that, you know, I don't count sheep, I count characters. And as I fall asleep, they stick in my brain. And when I get up in the morning, then I go to the computer and write it down. That's interesting. So you say that, then are, are you the person that can um, sit down at, um, you know, there's nobody in the house, you've got clear, a clear uh, path today between, you know, 10 and 2, so I'm going to sit down and write and you can just sit down and write? Or do you have to be in a particular mood? I have to be in a particular mood. I can nonfiction, I can write whole news releases or statements for clients on a thumb with my iPhone, and I have done it on ships, on planes, on trains, you name it. Uh, but for fiction, I have to be in a clear emotional state. And again, that sounds like something authors would have said that sounds pretentious. And, but. I have to be in a place where the mood is right, and I also have to be alone. My, my husband teased me when I started working on Upon This Rock. Um, he said, I'll go in the other room. I said, no, I really need to be alone. So I would write either in cafes, I can have white noise around me, or I would be totally alone. And mornings are best for me, uh, but I can write at different times of the day as long as, as long as I'm in a space where the only thing I'm thinking about is that character. Nonfiction, I can multitask. I can write a news release, I can write a speech, I can write several things at once. But if I'm writing fiction, I have to be in a kind of a clear space. Yeah, I'm the same. Actually, a lot of times I'll, I'll pick a city and go to it and stay in a hotel downtown, especially one I don't know, because I feel very, very alone in a group of people that I don't know, you know. Yeah, I think I, I love writing in cafes. I think it's great because also you get wonderful inspiration. But it's it, it's it's being a, it's that sense of being alone in a crowd that I think sometimes generates some some great writing. Yeah, I think it's great. But then how did how does things like um, like for instance you said you know this came out for for COVID timing and stuff. But how does something like COVID and something like uh, whatever's going on? But the last probably four or five years has been a very up and down, stressful and emotional time for us, especially a lot of Americans. So, and I just wonder with all of that going on around you and outside of you and with people you know and on the news, everywhere you look, doesn't that affect your mood and does that affect your writing? Oh my goodness, well you just said a mouthful and the answer is yes. Um, I spoke just a few weeks ago to a dear friend and fellow writer, also someone who kindly reviewed my book very favorably, the great Lucinda Hawksley. Uh, she is, besides being a well-known biographer and author in her own right, she is the great, great, great granddaughter of Charles Dickens. And uh, we were chatting the other day and she said she was talking to her agent and her agent said, if one more person brings me a book about lockdown, I'm going to throw it and them <laughs> out the window. And I said, I feel the same way because the idea for the sequel to Upon This Rock, which carries two of the characters forward, Adriano and Lee, and also the very enigmatic uh, character of Magda, a very uh, sexy and sensuous uh, spy type character. Think of her as kind of a 21st century Mata Hari. Um, they go forward into my next book. And I was just beginning it when COVID hit. I knew it was going to take place in this small Andalusian town in the south of Spain called Grasalema. I knew it had it as its backstory, the Spanish Civil War. And I was ready to start it and set it in 2020. And I thought, I cannot write about this period during COVID. One, I didn't feel creative at all. Uh, every day I try to write a haiku, which is 17 syllables, because the way I look at it is if I can't churn out 17 syllables, I'm really pathetic every day. Um, and there would be whole days where I couldn't write anything. So all of 2020 for me, I was also editing upon this rock. The book had been finished, but I was doing the editing. And that to me was like construction. I could focus on that. 
but I couldn't do any creative writing. And in the last few months as we've begun to crawl out of COVID, I call it, I've begun thinking about where I want to set this plot. And I have not quite decided, but I think the next book begins before COVID, and then the solution to the mystery takes place right around now, the year after. I just, uh, I want to avoid the entire four years of the Trump administration. I don't want to get too political, but I'm just going to kind of pretend they didn't happen. And then I don't want to write about COVID. And that's not just a political perspective. I want my book to stand on its own as a character and a mystery. I don't want people to think, oh, it's a COVID mystery or it's a political mystery. I want people to read it because it's a mystery and they find these characters interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people wish the Trump administration never happened. Um, but I think, unfortunately, we're, we're stuck with it and we're stuck with a lot of the uh, remnants. You know, you've got the Supreme Court and there's a lot of things. So, uh, But also, I would say it's probably better to stay away from that and COVID in the sense that it's so dated for now. It brings well, that's you know. it. And, and also, just frankly, to your point about being depressed is, you know, I, Alfredo always says, my husband, that I'm very perky, and I am pretty perky. But uh, my goodness, the worst pandemic in 102 years sometimes is really hard to stay perky. Um, I just didn't want to write about it. And also, frankly, to your point about it being dated, I, I'm sure there's going to be hundreds of books about COVID. Mine's not going to be one of them. So if anyone if anyone likes upon this rock <laughs> and wants to read my next one, I can promise you it's not going to be about COVID. Yeah, I, I think it's a wise move. But that, but you know, hey, um, how long does it take you to put together this book? Like, uh, and how long do you think the sequel will take? I think the sequel is going to go much faster. The first one took about two and a half years, and that wasn't constant writing. The, I would say the first sixty to seventy percent of the book was written in three months, but that was also because I had, for the first time in my life, the blessing of a four-month sabbatical. I turned over our PR clients to a consultant. So I had four months just to write. Um, and then over the next uh, two years, I finished it in uh, both here in California, but then in uh, subsequent tri trips back to Orvieto, which really fueled my imagination. The next one I'm uh, hoping to start writing in the next few months and do uh, at least finish parts of it when we are knock wood in Grasalema, Spain this, this summer. Well, hopefully that happens, you know. And what, was there a particular incident that happened or something in your life that gave you, let's say, the courage to actually decide to write and publish a book? Because it's a whole different world. Um, and I think that, I, I always say this, to actually put it out there and actually get your first book out there like that, um, it, it, it takes a, a little bit of courage. It takes some sort of uh, initiative. What, was there something you could identify as that? Well, gosh, I don't know if it takes uh, courage or foolhardiness. Or it's just kind of, you know, I, I once heard Ann Beatty during a Smithsonian lecture be asked, why do you write? And this woman was very serious. And Ann Beatty looked at her and said, well, I can't do anything else. And uh, the audience laughed, and I, but I think it was both an answer, uh, funny but also sincere. What she meant, I think, was she never could, she didn't have another talent in her mind, which I don't think is true, but it was a need. She, she couldn't do anything else. She had to write. Uh, for, for me, I've always written. I have known, well, to answer your question, when I was in first grade, I was giving one of, given one of those tests where you're supposed to, I was given tiles with words on it. And you're supposed to put the tiles together in this little cardboard thing where you would stick the tiles and make four sentences. And I instinctively wrote a story with those tiles. And I remember being whisked from Miss Wasicki's class down to Sister uh, Anne Marie's office, the principal, and I was like, what did I do wrong? And I was put in an elevated reading and writing class. It was one of those things they did in the 60s to see, you know, what your predilections were. Um, and I was taught by Benedictine monks, and I was uh, always intrigued by all the writing classes. So I, I guess my schooling, uh, I, I knew at an early age I liked to write and I could write. The fact that it took me so long to turn it into a novel, um, it's a question I've asked myself many years. Like I say, there is a book that has been in my drawer for literally 30 years since I was in my late 20s. Um, 
And I think the reason I didn't publish it back then was I didn't have the courage. Um, I think now what I've realized at age, now I'm 60, I was in my 50s when I finished, uh, started writing Upon This Rock, was that it takes the three P's to write and get a book published. Patience, persistence, and perkiness. And uh, those are the three P's that have helped me get this book published. And a lot of luck. And I have to, again, thank my publisher, Pace Press, uh, for taking a, a chance on me. So uh, do you like um, the new world of, of um, Amazon and, and all of the social media um, going on? Do you like to interact with readers and, and people on the Internet like that? I love it. I, I try to communicate and thank personally each of my readers. Um, I think Amazon is great. Uh, I also, of course, love independent bookshops. And I always tell people, if you want to buy my book, please go into an independent bookshop. Uh, Ingram, which is the worldwide distributor, uh, represents Pace Press, represents my book. If, you, if, if there's not a copy of Upon This Rock on the bookshelf in your independent bookstore, ask for it, they can order it and order through your independent bookstore. Having said that, Amazon has done a great job of distributing books worldwide, so I think that's great. And to your point of using social media, I spend an hour a day just selling my book, interacting with people. Uh, if someone writes me and says, I read something about your book, I have a friend who might like it, I try to get their email, I drop them a note. Right now on my desk in front of me, I have a stack of bookmarks, <laughs> and every time someone buys a book and I know about it and I hear about it online, I ask them to send me their address and I autograph a bookmark and send it back to them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a great believer in the old adage that... Uh, that John Wayne supposedly said one day someone saw him signing all these autographs over and over and over again and the guy said well doesn't it bother you all these people asking for your autograph and John Wayne says no it'll bother me when they stop asking for my autograph <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to communicate with my readers uh, and many of them have emailed me over the last year and a half. So what is your contact? Uh, where do you like uh, people to, to, to meet up with you? On which social media and do you have a website? I do. Uh, well, the website's very easy. It's my name, davidperry.com, and I love Facebook, which is uh, Facebook David Perry SF, and also the book has its own Facebook page, which is a great place, and that's uh, Upon This Rock or Vieto, and that's also on Instagram. Instagram I post all the time. My readers around the world have sent pictures of them reading the book in various interesting geographical places. I don't have one yet of the Taj Mahal, but I'm hoping for that, and then I post it on Instagram. But uh, Facebook, David Perry SF, or Facebook, Upon This Rock, or Vieto. Um, the other thing is, I use my full name because there are a lot of David Perrys in the world. It's <laughs> <laughs> including, evidently, a very famous Irish uh, computer game designer. So uh, when I wrote the book, I realized, oh, if, I, if someone Googles David Perry, they're going to get this Irish computer guy. So I use my full name, and I didn't used to like my middle name, but now I'm real happy about it because evidently I'm the only David Eugene Perry in the world who's an author. So oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It makes you stick out special. You know, yeah. that's well. We'll have all that linked up to our website as well, so people can find you with one click and uh, and off to the races there. So, um, so how do you? Or do you feel pretty satisfied now that the book's done? Are you happy with it the way it turned out? I am. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I finished it, and then I gave it to my husband to read. Many people ask if he, what he thought of it. He said, David wouldn't let me read it until it was done, and I didn't, because I wanted the book to be completely pure. I was like, if it's going to succeed, it's going to succeed, because I wrote it. I have some fellow authors who I have a great deal of respect for who believe in doing workshops and you know readings while they're writing and getting input. I, I have a great deal of respect for that process, but it's not for me. I, I don't do workshops. I don't do groups. I, I write, and if it succeeds, it succeeds. If it flops, it flops. So I read the book again after it was in print, and it was the first time I had actually read it through since I finished writing it, and I still liked it. So that, that made me happy. Yes, I still like it. There are parts of it that I think are a little bit long. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with it. Do, do you, so do you not have a person that you, so when you're, when you're finished a book like this or pretty done with the manuscript and you're um, pretty happy with it, do you have one person or a group of people that you 
can depend on to give you good feedback if you give it to them before you bring it to a publisher? Absolutely, my husband. He is both my biggest booster and my biggest critic. He will tell me, this this is good, this ain't good. So I trust him implicitly. And now that my publisher, uh, Pace Press, I have a relationship with, uh, for the next book, I'm sure I will send them chapters in advance. But as far as other groups and other writers, no, because I don't want to be influenced by them. I don't want someone to say, well, why did you do this? I, 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 I'm I, just, uh, like I said, I have a great deal of respect for people who belong to writing groups, but that's that's not the way that I write. So do you stay away, like when you're uh, in a writing process, when you've got a book in, in the go, um, do you stay away from reading other people's material? I do. I stay away from reading, but I do have my my secret, I think as I mentioned to you, I love British murder mysteries. I do watch TV murder mysteries because uh, that doesn't distract from my writing, but sometimes I will see something happen and I'm like, no one would believe that happened. Um, <laughs> That's the only thing that I allow myself. I don't read other writers while I'm while I'm writing. Well, I think with the recent times, you could all you know, with the way people have behaved in the last couple of years, in public, you you would have to really kind of. <laughs> this is reality is actually more freaky than than fiction. Like you could have wrote this story about how people reacted, let's say, with COVID some of the stupidity out there and conspiracies a couple of years ago and people would go, oh, no, that's just a little too far-fetched. You can't, it, truth, that old cliche is so true. Truth is truly stranger than fiction. And I guess that's one of the main reasons besides just having a distaste for this horrible pandemic in my, in my mouth. I don't want to write a book that in any way deals with that. I want mine to be completely pure as far as plot <laughs> yeah well not only that because the way people are so apt to be polarized that you you know you're you're going to get people mad at you all of a sudden you know and stuff well yeah, you know that's a very good question someone asked me this you know your book deals with church history and uh, uh is it pro-church or anti-church i said it's neither it's a book with characters in it and someone says well is it a gay novel or not a gay novel i said it's a novel with uh two gay characters and there's also uh uh, an older straight uh, character. And they're white, black, Italian, English, uh, American. To me, it's a novel. Uh, having said that, uh, it has been very gratifying to me as an openly gay author to write a book with two gay heroes, a, a married gay couple. Uh, someone, one of my favorite reviews, described it as uh, the, 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 the new version of the Thin Man series. I mean, I'm really dating myself there for anyone who remembers those wonderful movies. Yeah. The, the uh, Nick and Nora Charles, the, uh, the wonderful man and wife couple that liked their martinis while they were solving uh, mysteries. And uh, certainly Lee and Adriano, they liked their martinis while they're solving mysteries. So I found the idea of having an openly gay uh, mystery solving couple very compelling. And someone did ask me the other day, they said, well, if this was turned into a movie and someone said, well, we'd like to make the character man and wife, what would you say? I'd say, I'd say no. Uh, you know, the movies and, and film treatments always change books, but uh, there was a time when an openly gay couple, uh, as a mystery uh, solving couple, wouldn't be uh, of interest. But I've been told by people who work in the industry, film and, and TV, that right now there's so much content being put out there on you know Netflix and Amazon and and in the movies that uh, people are hungry for this sort of diversity of characters. So I certainly hope that's true, and I know my publisher's bank account hopes that's true too. <laughs> well, I think it is to an extent, but I think there's also a lot of trope characters, a lot of fallback characters that that writers use for a lot of these series and things you're seeing on streaming networks. So they they like to make um, kind of a mainstream of uh, what a typical gay couple is. Yeah, and it's changed. I mean, you know, I'm you know, the, the, watching the evolution of, of humanity over the last few years has been fascinating for me. Um, you know, I, I sometimes in my brain I play with who should play these various characters, and I've been asked that by a number of people. The one thing that I think would be great, because I, I love older characters especially, I think it's because I was raised by my grandmother and my maiden aunts, um, and I think also we we so seldom really truly write about people after they're a certain age. And there are several characters in my book that are quite old, including uh, Ladonna Volsini, who is the 
mysterious baker in Orvieto. She's in her 90s, and she has vivid mem uh, memories of World War II. And my husband Alfredo suggested, hmm, 92-year-old Italian woman. Who could play that that would make people interested? The answer is Sophia Loren. She's 93. So if anyone knows Sophia Loren, I got a role for her. <laughs> well, pass that. And she's the right age. <laughs> she's the right age, and she's she was just out doing something shortly. Uh, it wasn't too long ago I saw her. You know, yeah. Some sort of opening, you know. So so let's talk about what's next. Let's talk about what you've got coming up um, now. Well, so the the next novel, I don't have a name for it yet. I do know that it is a, a murder mystery, and it is. Uh, uh, inspired by uh, a horrible massacre during the beginning days of the Spanish Civil War in this tiny Spanish town in Andalusia, uh, Gresalema, uh, has about 1,500 people. It's a beautiful spot. Uh, it's hard to imagine when you see it that there were just horrible atrocities committed during the Spanish Civil War, but a massacre took place there that not a lot of people know about but I've been researching, and that serves as the stepping off point for this mystery. And then uh, another part of the book actually takes place uh, aboard ship, uh, which uh, may or may not be inspired by the two years that I spent working my way around the world aboard a cruise ship. But the two things uh, that those two locales have in common, along with Orvieto, is they're all kind of self-contained locations. You know, Orvieto is literally this little town on a rock, so all the characters interact with each other in this very close space. And uh, the next book will start aboard ship, a very self-contained space, and then move on to this uh, tiny little Spanish town. And I've always found that interesting as far as murder and mystery. And I think to this day the greatest murder mystery movie ever made, based on one of the greatest murder mystery books ever written, is Murder on the Orient Express, the original one, not the remake. And one of the reasons I find that movie mystery and the book mystery so compelling is all the characters are there in this one tiny contained space in one moment in time. And I find that just the greatest food and fuel for mystery possible. So uh, if, the, if, there's, if there's one movie that has inspired me, uh, it's that, the original Murder on the Orient Express. Yeah, good movie. Well, you're an amazing person, so we appreciate this, and we look forward to the new books. And, of course, anybody out there, if you don't have this book, you really should. This is an amazing book. It's called Upon This Rock. And, of course, the author who has been our guest, David Perry, thank you for being on the show. Alan, David, I'm so honored that you took the time to interview me, and I look forward to, uh, to hopefully being on again when I finish the next one. Thanks, David. Tired of wasting time trying to decide what to watch on your streaming service? Go to our website and look for the Martino Movie Reviews. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.